Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Nicklin. I'm Chief Executive of I Agree, and I'd like to thank you all for joining our March presentation. I'd like to welcome I Agree member Mike Whiting for our lecture today. After graduating from Harper Adams, Mike went on to spend 18 years in the animal feed industry. Mike's role exposed him to a variety of plant engineering disciplines, as well as managing operational change and continuous improvement projects. In 2011, Mike moved to the safety consultancy Numac Limited as a compliance engineer. His work covers clients in the UK, Europe, North America, in sectors such as agriculture, food packaging, forestry and construction. Mike's presentation today is going to focus in on the electromechanical elements of safety control systems. As usual, everybody's muted. If you would like to ask questions, please use the chat at the bottom of the screen. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll unmute you so you can ask in person. OK, over to you, Mike. Uh, thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. And uh, thanks for, to everyone who's dialed in today. Um, so just as a, an introduction, uh, Sarah uh, kindly asked me late in 2022 whether I would um, do a lunchtime lecture. And I said, Yep, I've got a got an idea of what I might do, um, but obviously just thinking about how um, how I'd put it together and portray it. So, so here we are, taming taming the dragon, understanding machinery safety safety architecture. So hopefully this first slide gives us a little bit of a, a wake up on a Tuesday afternoon. And um, if you could take us to our first slide, please, Sarah. Um, so what are we what are we covering today? Um, well, what is a safety circuit? Um, how can we develop our knowledge um, to ensure safety circuit compliance? Uh, and also the ultimate thing of, of where are we with regards to machinery design budgets? Um, we're all conscious of the fact that uh, we're in a, a very rapidly changing world, uh, alongside the fact that um, you know, we're, we're designing uh, new ranges of autonomous machinery. Um, I'll, I'll get some uh, kind of some some uh, the pointers in for for today's presentation. I'm going to keep things at a high level. Um, this can be uh, well. Let's term it as a, a heavy subject. And um, I don't mind uh, you know admitting to the fact that I've been involved with this uh, either on the fringe or more in depth really for the last ten years. And the number of times I need to. Uh, just stop, go back, look at things again, look at things again, uh, scratch my head and remind myself. So um, today is just part of the learning curve and uh, take every opportunity you can to, to cover this subject area. Um, so if we could move on. So really we need to ask ourselves, well, what is a safety circuit? And we, you know, we, we refer to the, uh, the standards just for a little bit of a definition here. Safety related part of a control system um, and, and this acronym, this SRPCS. So if you ever see these, this, this, this acronym, this is what it refers to. Part of a machine's electromechanical specification that is intended to reduce risk. Um, what do we include in there? Uh, well, the classic one is, is, is guard interlocks. And we're all familiar with um, you know, the, the, the types of range of machinery um, where there's some form of guarding on there, some form of process plant, etc. Um, it could be speed reduction. And, and more importantly, and obviously with regards to agricultural machinery, operator presence. And um, as, as, as by you know, Charlie's introduction, a lot of my background is in, involved in process plant. But one of the other things that we need to remember is that this also affects 24 volt DC circuits as well. So, you know, we're not just talking about the big three phase uh, installations, et cetera. You know, we, we we're down to those, uh, you know, those other circuits you know, and those DC circuits. Now, most importantly, it includes physically actuated e-stops. And I emphasize that point because it's one of those areas where certainly when I was getting getting an understanding of these areas, um, I wasn't quite quite fully aware and and just needed to be uh, reminded. So let's just let's just get ourselves clear on one of these things because um, we know when we're all stood by a machine, that big red button, an e-stop is a mechanically latching button. It's not designed for repeated use as a functional stop. Um, and we've all seen those scenarios potentially where somebody's operating a machine and 
bang, the red stop's gone, unlatch it, bang, it's gone again. They are designed as a mechanical latching so that when we go to them, they operate and they're, they're reliable operation. But if they're used incorrectly, um, then they can fail. And coupled with that, if our electrical circuit isn't monitoring things correctly, that e-stop could fail and it could go undetected and we wouldn't know about it. So it is really one of those important things to, to get in there um, because ultimately an e-stop is designed to do what it does do in an emergency. Okay, so again, you know, just a, a little bit of a, a headline there. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Great. Thanks. Move on. So what's, what's our headline messages? Um, so a safety circuit um, is only as effective as its, as its weakest link. And we all know the, the, the design scenarios when we talk about something like um, building a race car and putting a gearbox or braking system out of a much smaller car, should we say, uh, then it's not, you know, it's not something that, that we do. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at these safety circuits, it's, it's, it's kind of these headline messages. And again, thinking back to the, you know, the, the, the topic of today's presentation, my background is mechanical engineering and I'm, uh, electrically taught in some areas, um, electrically experienced, and, and then just really getting the standards out, reading and understanding and asking questions. So hopefully this is this is very much coming from a mechanical engineering thinking point of view. Um, and what the standards tell us is that at some point, um, an electromechanical safety circuit has the potential for failure. Something could go wrong somewhere, that that means that this the system could fail now hopefully that would that failure would uh be detected and we you know we get a a shutdown of the machine and, and the system um but that's what you know one of the things that we're talking about today how can we you know cover all bases of, as we would say and what um what safety related part of control system documentation standards legislation and guidance it guides us on that transition from uh, mechanical guarding through to a, a system re reliant um, upon some form of automation. So again, one of the key things is when you look at um, when we look at the standards, um, and we start off with things like what's called BSE and ISO twelve thousand one hundred, um, a cornerstone of of standards and and guidance. And that's that's what I found with that standard there is I can go to any machine that I have no preconceptions about whatever, and it can give me some starting points of, of what can go wrong with, you know, what could potentially go wrong. Um, because as we're aware, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, accidents don't always happen at 10 past one on a Tuesday afternoon when the sun is possibly shining. We're aware of the fact that things go wrong late at night when it's wet, dark, people are tired and other things have happened. Um, so what, 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 the, what the standards start, start talking us through is the fact that we always look at mechanical guarding as the first option. When we can't reduce the, the, um, the risk sufficiently by mechanical guarding, i.e. You know, the, the, the guard on the outside of a drive system that's bolted on there requires a tool to take it off, then we start graduating across to this, this safety related parts and control systems and, and how we put it in there. Because that second point there, what we're remembering is at some point, once we do introduce that electromechanical safety circuit, it has the potential for failure. The guard, providing we put the mechanical guard back on there and we've, we've done everything possible, it's going to go back on there. Um, so that's a very important factor to remember. And, and certainly, a, a, you know, any thoughts of saying, well, I've, you know, we must have e-stops everywhere, we must have so-and-so everywhere is, is one of the things to, to avoid. Um, and one of the other things is, is that all components are under the spotlight. Um, so um, what that means is, and, and, and again, um, where the standards help us, and again, back to the uh, mechanical logic, it's from the point of actuation of, of the signal. So whether that is um, a, a light beam and, and, and somebody putting their arm through a light beam um, or um, you know, some other method, um, 
uh, right through to the point of the cessation of power. So the contactor in the electrical panel um, and the, the operator uh, presence sensor through to dis physically disengaging, in, disengaging, the disengaging the drive. So really, you know, if we, if we think about these, these points here, um, then you know, we, 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 you know, we're summarizing a point that we, every, every part of the circuit is, is important. Um, the, when we say the circuit, the wiring elements are, are there as a, a, a joining mechanism and providing that we've, we've used the correct wiring, then that's not such, so much of an issue. But it's com you know, those components that are, are going through the system. So hopefully that gives, starts to build up a little bit of a, a picture there. So if we could just go on to the next one, please. Um, standards to provide guidance. Um, and again, a, a good reminder. So where are we on standards? So um, uh, we have the legislation. So we have the EU machinery directive. We have the uh, UK supply of machinery safety regulations, high level legislation, which we are required to comply with. When it comes to standards, um, the, the reference to standards is that they are uh, a presumption of conformity. So in a court of law, um, then by applying the, the ethos of standards and guidance, then we're seen to be, a, you know, a deemed to be demonstrating compliance. Um, so here's some, here's some details um, and, and some details on, on, on the standards. So 13849 is a, is kind of the, the, the mainline standards that we're talking about today, 13849 uh, part one and part two, um, relevant for electrical and mechanical safety circuit, um, uh, considered easier to understand and applied compared to another standard, which is 62061, um, which is one of the ones below. So yes, uh, mechanical engineer um, uh, uh, takes the option of the easier standards. That's not, that's not specifically true because these 13849 is, is, is mainly associated with headline mechanical um, systems, hydraulic systems. Um, just for information, people will always say, well, why are all these standards there? They did, they have made attempts. There's, this is attempts by um, global experts at this level to, to combine 13849 and 62061, which I'll come on to in a minute, or that it was deemed too complex. Just coming on to, um, sorry, just looking at three, uh, 13849 part one and part two. Part one is the the uh, engine room of the standard. It's the doing, it's the detail. Part two is the commissioning, because as we're all aware, when we're designing machines, whether it's got any electrical me mechanical parts or not at all, we've got to we've got to test it. And one three eight four nine is is focused on the testing. Um, so that's the reason for the two parts there, and, and the fact to, to differentiate them. BSEN six two zero six one. Um, this is mainly focused on um, uh, purely electrical based safety circuitry. Although in the updated version, um, this can be applied to uh, hydraulics and, and pneumatics. Um, I've not had any involvement with 62061 at all. Um, as per my opening comments, I've had enough um, uh, getting through 13849 and I've had no requirement to go down the 62061 route. But no doubt at some point, um, that may become a, a more of a feature. Um, so today we're, we're going through the, uh, the, the BSEN uh, 13849 series. Just as a footnote there, we all appreciate and aware of the fact that uh, standards are updated. And um, where th there is, when you go on the BSI website, there is the uh, BSI ISL 13849 2021 version, but it's only there as a draft version at the moment. Um, so that's, that's awaiting uh, confirmation. Uh, and no doubt sometime within the next 6, 12, 18 months, that will be uh, will be rolled out. What, where, where that where that changes from uh, the 2015 version, I'm not quite sure yet. Now, just while we're on this area of standards, um, and I appreciate we've got a, a, a range of people dialing in today with a range of experiences. If you go on the BSI website and put in um, uh, uh, safety-related parts of control systems, agricultural machinery, you'll come up with a, what's called a BSEN 25119 series of standards. Now, I haven't had any particular re reference to use those. Um, 
I've had a quick look through them, just the, uh, the, the available summaries this morning, just on those. And they are, from what I understand, focused primarily at the high level, high level electrical side. And certainly when I looked at one of the standards under 25119, it said not mechanical, electrical or pneumatic hazard related. So that's that's just a, a, a reference point there, just when you're putting things in um, and looking for standards. So um, if we go on to the next one, please, Sarah. Start with some familiar territory. Um, again, back to uh, back to the mechanical engineering principles, flow charts, diagrams, and some form of, of definitions. So in Annex A of um, one, uh, 13849 Part 1, there is this risk assessment. Um, and what um, uh, we're all familiar with sitting down doing some risk assessments, um, you know, we get a piece of paper out, what's the hazards, who's at risk, how we're going to mitigate risks, um, reduce as much as possible. But what this, what, what 13849 is doing is it's taking us through a defined process. Um, because ultimately what we're looking to do um, is we're looking to achieve what's called this performance level um, for the, the safety circuit. And 13849 works on this, this range from A to E, and A being a, a, a lower risk and an E being a higher risk. So what we could do very quickly is, is just with this screen here, is just go through, through an example at a high level risk. Now, one of the good examples that I, I use is um, uh, a person working in a factory on the shop floor with the, the press break. Uh, what I mean by the press break, the piece of sheet steel going into the, uh, uh, the uh, guillotine section um, and um, something happening uh, and then... Uh, um, changes to the metal work, et cetera, et cetera. But if things go wrong, there could be a serious injury. So if we're looking at this and we're starting off at number one, we're immediately on to an S2, which is a, a serious irreversible injury. Um, are we exposed to this for very long? Well, actually, yes, we are, because we're stood next to it all the time. Uh, we're, we're safe in where we are, but we may have some form of control system, whether it would be a light guard or otherwise. So again, F2, um, exposure time is long. Um, could we avoid it? Well, not really, because if something goes wrong and we're stood there and, and that safety circuit fails, um, scarcely possible P2, that would be um, that would be obviously, a, you know, an E rating. That's just an example there, just on, on the extreme. But what you'll see by the the um, uh, the graphics there as you work through is that We've got these options to go through, and this is where um, you know a, a detailed risk assessment needs to be done at the at the design stage stages of equipment with all the relevant relevant stakeholders to see where we fit, obviously, on this uh, range of A to E, because that is a foundation which then drives um, the determination of the rest of the safety circuit. Um, so PLR, again, PLR is, is this um, uh, definition for uh, performance level required. And again, when you open up 13849, the first four, nearly three to four pages are all denotations. So you'll see other things like what's called a B10D value, lots of other things um, which is re relating to performance of components. And what are we what are we talking about? Well, what we're talking about is what's called essentially a minimum value for this MTTFD, um, which is the mean time to dangerous failure. Uh, and it's not the MTTF value. Quite often you can look at components and you can select a component and it'll give it sometimes give an MTTF value, but it's the MTTFD. What's the mindset that we're looking for? What we're, what we're all the time aiming for is what is the potential for this safety circuit to fail to a dangerous state, whether that be an undetected or whether it be a combination of faults, because sometimes we can get a combination of faults that can happen on the system and we get a scenario called fault masking. Um, that's probably the only time I'll mention that today because um, uh, some of the... Uh, uh, big component manufacturers that run these seminars do about an hour and a half just on fault masking itself. 
But if we can get this, these headline things in of, of saying, well, we're going to put electromechanical safe, uh, circuit in place. What we need is it needs to detect a system and shut the machines down. So again, just as a, a footnote again, if, you, if you're looking through these things and you think, well, hang on a minute, Mike was referring to this MTTF D value, all of a sudden I've got a SIL value. The reason is, is that the, the SIL value, SIL value is safety integrity level. That relates to the standard 62061. Um, if you go, when you go through 13849, it does give you a little bit of a ready reckoner between the two. Um, so, and usually 90% of the time, um, components will give a SIL value and the MTTDF values. So, um, again, you know, starting with, a, you know, the, the, a piece of paper, a pen, uh, and, and the discussions around the table. So if we could go on to the next one, please, Sarah. So getting down to the detail um, and really not trying to get down to the detail too much because um, we'd said we, we keep things at a higher level. So really what we're talking about is, is, you know, these takeaways from today's presentation. So we talked about things about the e-stop. Um, we've talked about... Um, this, this risk assessment um, and, and getting this value of, of A to E. Um, what do these things mean? What are, what is this terminology? And here's, here's some examples. And as I say, one through eight, four, nine, if you've got a, a spare, a, a spare couple of hours, you can start reading through that. Uh, MTTF for the components, so specification, reliability, uh, and potential limitations on application. Because certainly, um, uh, you know, you'd be looking at components and some may be more applicable to others. So when, you, um, when you're looking at through, through some of the guidance, uh, one of the examples it gives is um, interlocks and safety sensors in a food processing area uh, using something like milk um, or maybe another, another liquid or food or substance. But one of the factors is, is that corrosion. So we, we very much need to, you know, consider the, the whole working environment. Um, the MTTFD for the channel. So when we talk about the channel, this is the, um, this is when we're referring back to that uh, scenario of what's, what's happening in that circuit from the point we've actuated the, the, uh, um, the system, i.e. something needs to be stopped right through to the contactor or the disengagement of power. And, and this, uh, the safety circuit is on a range of one to four. So again, this is all within this um, A to E definition. And again, as I say, we're keeping things at a, a fairly high level today. Um, level one is a very simple safety circuit, um, which um, a single fault could lead to the loss of the safety, safety function completely. Um, when we're, when we're talking um, channel four, we're talking with the, the phrase that we're probably all aware of, which is used, which is backup redundancy systems in there. Um, and, you know, the new, again, as a, as a, as a explanation or to give the credence to it, nuclear power station, that type of level, but also, you know, those type of things where somebody is exposed to a, uh, you know, an, a hazard. If there was a failure of the system, they could be uh, and exposed to an injury. Um, so again, this all comes within here. Diagnostic coverage. When I've been on the the, the various safety courses and um, uh, by the uh, the learning professionals, then this this what's called diagnostic coverage has been emphasised as a very important um, part of a safety circuit. So if if you can um, uh, if you can visualise that we we have we all have a safe we, we have a safety circuit in front of us. And we say, right, we're going to stop the safety circuit and we're going to send a signal back round to check whether it's, it's failed or not. Um, and it's signal comes back, great, we're okay. When are we next going to send that signal round again? Well, we're going to send it round in the next two seconds, maybe, or one second or half a second. But what, what could happen is, is that safety circuit could fail while we're sending that signal round. And it wouldn't be picked up until the next time we sent that signal back round again, which might be a second later, might be two seconds later, which doesn't sound much. But if we think back to that press break and that, uh, you know, that that scenario of, of, of um, 
of uh, a combination of hazards. Just think about the standard one three eight double five um, approach speeds uh, of the body to a to a hazard. How quickly does our hand move? How quickly does our foot move towards something? Common cause failure. Um, this is a, a a factor which is uh, uses a scoring assessment. Um, but one of the um, and it's usually a it either passes or it fails. But one of the important things is, and again, one of the things to emphasise about the safety circuit is it's this diversity. The fact that when we're looking at safety circuits, um, we you know we we look at the options of where we have um, diversifying the engineering disciplines. So we might have pneumatics as a backup. Um, so within the circuit, but that also means that if the pneumatics is the backup, we need to have as much. Uh, emphasis on the checking that pneumatics if it fails as well as well as the electromechanical side so again uh as i say we're you know we're covering these areas okay if we go on to the next slide please sarah are some of the factors more important than others um yes certainly um then you know again when we're looking at these areas and, and i as i emphasized before this diagnostic coverage uh, and channel architecture are, are very, very important. And what happens is, is that uh, when we're looking through 13849, um, although it's a complex standard, it does, um, it does give us uh, these uh, um, mechanical related um, schematics in terms of graphs and diagrams where we can um, run across the graph and say, okay, then, well, we, we know we've got to achieve a PL d maybe right okay then we've got we, we then got bandwidths and we then got bandwidths of what's called the diagnostic coverage and the channel that we need to we need to achieve um how often will a sensor be activated during use so this is where um where we have to if we put ourselves in the in the um position of the um designers of the driverless cars that are out there now and will be out there more in the future they've gone through this process and, and the same as looking at our culture machinery saying well okay then how often are these sensors going to be used how often is something going to be detecting um something happening um and and this is again is is where it's it's the round the table discussions uh, we may have some test data that's available from prototype machines but ultimately, what are we always trying to do as safety professionals? We're trying to apply those worst case scenarios uh, and, and obviously document all these things. And very much so when we're designing all these you know, new ranges of equipment, um, all this background research and, and prototype information forms an essential part of the technical file. So videos, um, component details, test data, all those types of things. Um, really, what we're saying is, is that we're aiming to confirm that this whole safety system is robust and effective across the machine's intended life cycle. And again, um, quite often, and uh, when I've been on to uh, stands at the trade events talking with people, and we'll look at machine, and I'll say, that's great, yeah, um, let's just have a look at it in six years when it's been worked really hard and hasn't been maintained maybe as well as it should have been. And then we'll have a look and just see how things are working because that's the ultimate. And again, six years, you know, some of these machines, what, 10 years, 12 years, uh, you know, certainly well within their lifespan. Alternatively, will components need to be replaced at a defined time before potential failure? And I, I thought about this element. How often do we take our car into for a service and we've got the service sheet there and it said uh we know about the cam belt changes or, and it might be okay we have to change so-and-so sensor well there's a reason for that because somewhere along the testing they've said right we need to change that sensor because it's important for another part of the car's safety system before it potentially fails and our either um, component data or testing has said we've got to get these changed at a certain time and again, what will this mean in the future for our cultural machinery? Will this mean that, uh, uh, you know, we'll have to do certain changes for certain things by uh, approved personnel, dealers, et cetera, um, as we're already aware? So that, again, gives a little bit of understanding. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Are we confused? Uh, well, yes. Yeah, we're, we're certainly uh, uh, partly confused um, because um, um, we're mechanical engineers. 
And all of a sudden, somebody, we've been thrust into this world of electrical wires and calculations. Um, what we need to remember is, is that standards are written for the right reasons, um, very prescriptively, to avoid ambiguity. And they, the, 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 um, the professionals across the EU and across the world spend many time with the, the individual words to make sure. One of the other challenges with 13849 that I found out about was it's not only written for people, um, machinery designers like ourselves, it's also written for the component manufacturers. So it's, it's, it's written for those people that are designing those interlocks. So um, I am um, uh, with one of the circulars that came around. Um, I went and bought a book, um, uh, Decoding e ENISO 13849. And um, it was probably one of the best purchases I've, I think I've made. But, and uh, um, because certainly I was, um, uh, when, uh, you know, going through 13849, 13849 time and time again becoming uh, a little bit um, uh, uh, a bit of the usual flat spin etc but this this book explains the practical uh, applications jargon busters um, what do you mean by jargon busters well mttfd and years does it mean real years no if it says 150 years it means 150 devices operated for one year anticipate that one of them would fail Explanations of components. Uh, again, positively driven contacts. What does it mean? Um, should a main contact have become welded in position, monitoring contacts are forced to remain open and the safety related parts of the control system detect a fault. So certainly it's, 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 a, it's a, 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 a very valuable reference document um, and whether there's one of those for 62061, um, then uh, I'm not sure. Other, other um, you know, uh, books are maybe available out there, but certainly um, the author of this one um, very much wrote it to, um, uh, with the, 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 the um, a mechanical engineer basis in mind. Um, so um, if we go on to the next slide, please. Keep applying basic engineering principles. Keep hanging on to those things. Um, various photographs available in the library, but I thought this one would sum things up fairly well because um, uh, uh, that's probably a, a, a uh, you know rear discharge spreader on a you know, normal day. Um, interlocks and sensors need to remain operational in all working conditions. Potential for misuse and defeat. Um, when you go through the standards, um, BSEN uh, 13849 um, um, and 14119, which is for interlocks, what's the potential for defeat of these standards? Can somebody defeat them? What's their motivation? We need to look at all options there as possible. Um, don't forget the machine's life cycle. So one of the important things is, is that you, put the, you put the safety circuit in place, but it's got to maintain through the life cycle. So we talked about you know, operators replacing, it, replacing components and we need to retain that um, performance level. And one of the other things, and just re get, again referring to the standards, uh, 12,100 quite makes it clear there, the absence of an accident history, a small number of accidents or low severity of accidents ought not to be taken as a presumption of low risk. So we have very much really got to, Got to uh, look at all options of what could go wrong. Um, if we go on to our next slide, please. Is it an exact science? No, it's it's not an exact science. But what we are doing is is we're applying a defined process um, to ensure the safety related parts, the control system, is effective across the, the machine's life cycle, and, and, and reducing risk. And certainly we can easily fall in, well, potentially, um, uh, let's say fall into the trap, but almost um, be hoodwinked maybe by the fact that, um, you know, oh, we've suddenly got a lot of components that are very high level on a, a performance level, but it's only when they're put together. It's only when it's all together in the safety circuit and, and uh, that they're actually effective. What are we looking to achieve? Again, driverless car if you in, in the future you want to get in there the first thing we want to make sure is that it doesn't go anywhere if it's a fault again with the machinery automated machinery detects a fault before startup uh, and providing obviously the the controllers wherever they are with relevant information and also 
the the safety the technician that's walking towards that machine that needs to do some maintenance on it is they're walking towards that machine and they want to know that that machine isn't going to start up uh, again just to reference back to part two of, of one three eight four nine focus on the validation of the safety circuit very important same principle we set up machines on test rigs we test them hard um, then again you know we'd be looking at what what the validation of the safety circuit is um, on to our next slide please some examples and further thoughts um so you know uh, the classic question uh you know might you know what would we expect to see well as an example we, we started off on the presentation with our e-stop when we look at um, the standards, an e-stop is required to achieve a minimum of PLRC. So if we think back to our A to E, um, the C is the you know, okay, the middle of the road there. That doesn't mean that it's it's not as effective as uh, as E. But what it's saying is is that if we think back to what we said before, the e-stop is there only to be used as an e-stop. If we start using it as a functional stop, then um, we can, um, you know, we potentially, um, you know, the, the uh, mechanical action could break in there. And that, and, and the reminder is, it's a minimum of, of PLRC. So it doesn't mean it, it couldn't be any higher than that. This is again, just a, as a, a, a broad basis, most agricultural forestry, food processing equipment will be aiming probably for the range PL, PLC to E. But remember that this initial risk assessment determining our requirements. Um, are there, uh, along with our um, our publication decoding EN ISO 138449, are there other options? Yes, there's toolbox options. There is a, um, a, 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 a online um, calculator system called Systema, which many people would know about, which is uh, available for use and you can download information. But it is. Um, it's like any computer system and needs to be managed because what you get out of it is only as accurate as what you put in. Um, safety component calculators. So there are um, the uh, the uh, safety component um, or the safety component suppliers. So I was aware of the fact that PILTS, um, they um, have had their Pascal system, um, which uh, again, I, I uh, went on one of their courses many years ago. And they, one of the advantages of their system was that it went through a, a stage process where until you'd selected the components and it gave you a green tick in the box, you couldn't go any further on with it. Um, so again, there are options out there. But one of the other important things is read component specification data. Does it meet the required performance level? And as we've said before, and, and you know, we need to be aware of, um, they will quite often give a reminder to say that if you link a lot of these components in series, then um, a, a PLR performance will start to drop off uh, against what the intended uh, requirement is. So if we could move on, please. So as we're coming to the end of the presentation, have we have we reached our required performance level? So let's let's get back to some basics. CE plus CE does not equal CE. Um, the first mantra that was um, uh, indoctrinated into me on the first uh, machinery safety course that I went on. Because what that means is, is that as we've said all throughout this, if we take all those PLE related components that we've got and, and, and all those e-stops e that are compliant with the required standard 13850, great. But until we put them all into that safety system and until we've applied the requirements of uh, 13849 part two, then we don't know whether we've achieved and we can't confirm whether we've uh, achieved the, the, the required performance level across the machine's life, life cycle. Can we achieve balance? Um, well, we're going to have to do. You know, we haven't got any options. Um, and certainly... As we, you know, look at look to the future, um, we are going to have to really uh, dig down into all of our engineering capabilities, and and look to um, uh, look to obviously ensure maintain safety and efficiency, um, and and really look at all the areas of, of design. Um, we're you know in terms of 
composite materials that may be lighter, uh, which we already, you know, do in terms of look at the guarding on the, probably the edge of a combine harvester header or lots of other equipment, um, um, you know, uh, trail machinery, composite, um, composite um, uh, components and, and raw materials used there. But certainly um, we're going to have to exploit all these areas. Um, and also, really, what will other stakeholders look for um, re regarding machinery compliance to provide the, the required cover? So that could be, what about the local authority that's going to buy all those automated machines to um, run across the uh, run, run across the parks and cut the grass? And somebody says, is there going to be anybody present? Yes, lots of people present, um, um, potentially. Um, and that's just one area. Um, so if we could take on to our final slide. Um, thanks very much for, for listening. Um, uh, I usually find it good to end on a quote and um, lots of engineering quotes out there. Um, but a gentleman that we're all very much aware of um, and he's got his uh, feet in both camps or lots of camps. Uh, manufacturing is more than just putting parts together. It's coming up with ideas, testing principles and perfecting the engineering as well as the final assembly. So uh, um, I shall... Uh, Sign off with, with James Dyson uh, and uh, thank you very much. And answer any questions. Oh. Okay, thanks for that, Mike. Uh, yes, we've got uh, a question from David Williams. David, do you want to unmute and ask? David? Yeah, yeah hopefully this, this works. Um, I've been involved in several cases uh, brought by HSE where they've required agricultural implement manufacturers to install guard interlocks that disconnect either the tractor PTO or hydraulic power supply. Have you any suggestions how this can be achieved considering that the implement manufacturer just supplies half of the system and has no control whatever over the make, model or facilities on, that might or might not be available on the tractor that powers the implement? Uh, David, you've, you've asked the, um, the, uh, the golden ticket question. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, because effectively, as you're saying, you're tapping into somebody else's safety circuit. Yeah. Um, and I am sure, and um, I, I'm sure many people dialing in today, there are tractor manufacturers sat there now, uh, day in, day out, having these discussions. Um, the key thing is, 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 is if we, you know, we go back through those first principles of, of what happens. Um, you know, the safety circuit is, is only any, any as effective as, as its weakest link. Um, you know, how can we always say that that trap is going to be connected to that machine? Um, so uh, it's very much a case of, of, of laying out all the things that could go wrong all the potential areas that somebody could um, um, a, 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 a potential for misuse, lack of maintenance. And, and, the, and the key thing is, David, is saying when it detects a fault and saying we, we've checked, we've, you know, we've, we've tried to check this circuit, it doesn't work, right, nothing works. And then it's, but then it's the important thing is, is telling the operator why it's not working. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, so, so it's, it's, it's a, um I, I, yeah it's it's a it's a it's a humongous question yeah I mean, we, what, one particular issue um one particular case was involving a um a sheet winder where a, a large vegetable um grower ha had put sheets of plastic film or netting over his uh, brassicas and then this um uh, had a, a sheet winder to pull in the the, the sheeting after at the end, when it wasn't used anymore and of course he had a fleet of brand new tractors but because this was a, a a low power job, he used the oldest tractor on the fleet to to operate the the sheet winder, and somebody got caught up in it. And HSC said there should be stop buttons all over the place, um, which actually the implement manufacturer disputed. He said they actually caused more problems than 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 they uh, solve. Uh, and but but the the tractor had no facilities to to inter interlink with the with a stop button anyway uh, so, uh, so it, it's a real real problem when 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 you read you know you read the standards and you you read the guidance and it is th this the, the mantra there's nowhere to run nowhere to hide because with a safety circuit everything's involved you can't suddenly suddenly say ah oh, well we'll just 
link off so and so because as soon as you start um, uh, watering down your safety circuit and piggybacking other things on the back of it, then then you, 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 your your um, performance level drops off. Um, so it's it, it's very much a case of saying, well, you know, it's this effectiveness of the safety circuit, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you that's that's the question, which is a is a is is a a, a a big nut to crack and um uh it, it raises lots of queries um um and uh, put it this way um uh, you know we saw some of the photos there on the presentation um and um you know we, we we know what you know happens with you know certain machines look at the example of the tesla the first tesla car accident what it was I and mean, this is a, a people probably might not know the details more than i do car coming over a hill on a night and it was the angle of the lights and it was some reflection. It was some of this and it was something else. But, you know, it, it, that, that, that was, on, you know, just a combination of events. Yeah. But, but to quote the supply of machinery safety regulations, they say that the uh, machinery manufacturer must eliminate all risk. How can they possibly do that? It, well, it, it's not workable. Well, well, yeah, and, and the other thing is, is in again, and, and this is where we get back to, you know, and, and uh, um, uh, back to the BSE and ISO 12,100, it mm -hmm. says you can put other safety systems in place, but unless you've checked all of those safety systems to make sure they haven't created yet another hazard you're not aware of, you're defeating the object. You've yeah. created more of a hazard. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So it's... Um, uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's, it's a biggie is that one, David? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I haven't answered the question specifically. Rather than I, just, saying, I, I'm not I'm not sure that you can. Well, <laughs> it's 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 something I've been arguing with uh, with um, with the barrister for the last number of weeks, uh, and we haven't got anywhere. <laughs> Uh, yeah, certainly. You get these just lay out, and 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 I, what I crock up and do is I go through the standards and I pull out some headline information. Mm. You get that big headline, you know, information there, yep. um, and, and um, then that, that 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 can focus people's attention. And 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 the other crazy thing I'm dealing with at the moment is that uh, uh, the designer has to uh, make the machine safe when in normal use and reasonably foreseeable misuse which which is i mean people do some crazy things but you're, you're supposed to protect against them against themselves yes and, and that's where we we, we 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 is it reasonable and practicable um you know um you know how much we know that operators manuals and safety mm. decals are the last line of defense mm. um so we need to do we inherently safe design measures Classic thing, working from height. We don't don't work from height, um, mm -hmm. you know. So it's 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 you know. And then, but then we're into this area of how do we reduce it? Where do we start um, mm -hmm. introducing electromechanical safety systems and making sure that they are you know robust in use, mm -hmm. um, you know, across all those those, those working conditions. Um, so. Uh, yeah, interesting, and that, that could be a that could be a, a, a lunchtime lecture on its own, David. But I don't mm. know whether we'd uh, <laughs> yeah. cover that one off. Right. Thank you, uh, Mark Andrews. Well, I, I'd just like to congratulate you. I think that's a um, a really good presentation on quite a challenging subject. Probably one of the most challenging subjects I think the uh, the institute has had for a long time. So, so really well done. Wondering if you can talk me through some of your experiences on something that I, I'm a mechanical engineer, you're a mechanical engineer. Unfortunately, we have to deal with software. We have to deal with software development and validation. Wondering if you could just talk for a few seconds on that, please. Uh, yes, certainly. And, uh, and Mark, thanks for your supportive comments. Um, um, so uh, um, I hope I've done it some justice. And um, But... Um, with software, well, the, 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 there is, and this standards, and I, I can't quote the details, but there are some specific languages that are referred to for use of software. Um, there are obviously um, uh, the, the ability to um, prevent uh, people hacking into software. 
So, um, and, and, and getting access uh, into it. Um, there, there is very, there is quite a lot in, there is elements in um, uh, 13849 part two for the validation side. So uh, of, of the software, and that's probably uh, where the 62061 standard would, would start to come into its own a lot more as well. Um, and uh, that's a, a, a dragon for another day. So you know, those headline, even mechanically allied principles of, well, it's got to be robust in use across the, across the system. I mean, the other thing is, of course, what we know about software, um, a, a safety PLC, a safety PLC has got three elements, from what I understand. So if one element fails, there are two elements that can still say to each other, we've got a problem. We can and shut the system down safely. Um, so certainly when you when you're looking at that where then um and, and that's Mark, that's probably you know my summary of that area. It's it's not something I've had a great deal of detail in, and, and I would certainly you know, I would certainly be the right. Okay, back to the auditor. Look at the standards. Can we demonstrate X, Y, and Z? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and of course, you get um, certified validation software tools to which uh, add, add a further layer of complexity. So, thank you very much. Was there a second part of your question, Mark? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, okay, th uh, a, a separate question. Really looking at professionals first consumer products um, and the challenges with um, uh, different environments, different um, uh, performance levels, stroke safety integration levels. Uh, wondering if you can just briefly touch on that. Um, so just, just trying to understand the question. So when you say, would you say in consumer products there? Yeah, like, like a, a chainsaw could be a uh, could be sold at uh, B and Q, um, and you could have a, a consumer buy it. Um, alternatively, it could be a higher end uh, from a proper what I'll call proper dealership, um, and the, the difference in functional safety um, based on based on the user's level of proficiency. Ah, right. Okay. Well, I suppose there's two there's two elements there because we immediately we've got the, um, uh, um, you know, we, we we've got the scenario possibly where, where one gets used twice a year and the other one gets used every other day, um, and your professional user might maintain it more than your um, consumer user, um, and I suppose the other thing we've got to remember is is that. Um, the resale products can go back on the market and be sold from one person back into another market. Um, so uh, uh, the belt and braces approach is uh, uh, is uh, certainly with um, a lot of the machinery I've been involved with um, is is to try and take is, is to aim for the the worst case scenario and to say well okay then you know what what is this machine capable of doing. Um, and, and okay, then operator proficiency. Yes, um, I mean, we're, we're, you know, again, we're looking at this whole area of, of the machine failing safe or being able to inform the operator as much as possible. Um, and, and then if it does fail, well, it has to, you know, it has to go back in to get an approved component change. Um, so uh, whether that answers your question fully enough, I mean, you know, the whole ethos of this whole safety system is, is that by whatever means, whether the, 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 the equipment is operational or it's in a maintenance mode or breakdown or something, the, the system is safe and somebody knows how to keep it safe when it's operational again. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, and it's, it's quite often the harmonised standards of different performance levels within them to, to help mitigate that but it is uh, only a only um uh, um only a, a, a it's a challenge um when we when we when when i read the accident reports a day you know the, we get them come through daily and when you when you read the accident report what happened 
six hours ago, six days ago, when something happened and somebody changed something on a machine that then left something else happened. And then, and it's this scenario of, well, you know, actually then at, you know, then at whatever time. And then what happened is it was a power cut. Um, I mean, I, as, as Charlie alluded to, I, I worked in the process plan. Um, you get a power cut on a on a big, you know, a big process plan at the wrong time. Um, I, you know, and it gives us a few challenges. And when you've got conveyors full up and everything else, and you've got to get stuff going again, um, then you know. So that's another, you know, another factor that comes into things. Um, so it, it's it's. Um, I've always gone for the worst case scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, questions from me. Um, what's I'd be interesting to see what your view is on autonomous equipment. So. Do, do you think autonomous machines should be designed with a much higher level of safety than a machine that has an operator sat on it? Um, and what I'm trying to get at is, is people want to take autonomous machines to the nth degree of safety. Um, and I kind of often sit there thinking that if you've got a, a an operator machine, somebody with an operator sat on it, that person take control of that machine in the advent of a, a, an issue. So my view is that an autonomous machine must be at the same level. It doesn't necessarily have to be better. I'm just interested to see what your view is on that. Yeah, it's a, it's good. It's a very good question, Charlie, because when, um, uh, as you, I mean, when I've done some work um, within the food packaging sector and the last, the last set of work, you know, is involved with, you know, a number of factories where operators are working alongside robots. So we already know about the Amazon, um, you know, that where people are op operating against automated forklift trucks. Um, and I suppose we, what we need to do is we need to make sure that that, um, that safety circuit is, is reliable in use. So when it's chucking it down with rain and it's snowing, um, that that you know those sensors are you know operational, or they give a message to somebody and say, well, we can't start the machine because we've got these sensors have got to be cleaned off. Um, and and, and uh, you know we we then got the situation of saying, well, at what point um, you know do we avoid putting security guards, or, or, or you know how do we make sure we don't need to have security guards on the outside of the field when the autonomous machines operating? Um, the classic example is, and I was, and I was, you know, I kind of preempted some of these questions. It's, it, you know, you've got that hundred acre field, um, and um, you know the machine's gone across it, and, and there's nobody there. But up against that hundred acre field is a bridle path, um, and the and there's uh, 50, 60 kids, sixty children on the school trip. Adult to child ratio isn't quite as much as it should be, you know, and they're all they're all you know 16, 25 foot into the field, walking all the way down. And that machine's coming up on its headland pass. Um, so, you know, in that situation, well, we know it's got to, you know, um, you know, inform the people that the machine is there. But is one thing, obviously. And uh, sometimes, you know, first thing is the flashing lights, and the second thing is 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 making sure it stops. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you know, lots of these testing cycles, but avoiding the situation where those they become too complex. And they become counterproductive. Mm. Uh, and uh, open it up to the forum. This is where this is where one of the challenges we've all got is because I remember, you know, going to, going along to one of the first, you know, farm equipment technical committee meetings, and and Keith Hawking, you know, said he said, look, he said standards are developed for two areas: they, they follow um, technological design, or unfortunately, incident rates. And what's happening at the minute? The standards are keeping up with where we need to be um so um it's it's going to be a um you know interesting times but this certainly when you're going through these standards and being able to demonstrate that you've tested it um and it's reliable in use against the foreseeable scenarios mm. so it's it, it's it's you know th th that's that's the, uh, the you know what 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 we're aiming for and um um and certainly, you know, what, you know, the type of things I was referring to, you know, if I was a technician or an engineer going towards a machine that was stuck in the field, got itself 
stuck for whatever reason or you know it broke you know you, you know your first thing you want to make sure is nothing's going to happen and i you know we've got control over the situation you just punch the e-stop <laughs> Well, yeah, but you don't want to be good. Cause you, yeah, it is, yeah, yeah, possibly. But, um, but anyway, it's, um, yeah, right. I'm conscious of time, jo John Baines. If you if you can be swift with yours, because uh, we're just coming up to uh, that. Thanks, Charlie. Um, my background has been in automatic milking systems and rotary milking parlors, and uh, until the machinery directive. It was commonplace for people to use the standard stop start systems, for example, in the rotaries to, as a safety system as well. Clearly, that was no longer um, permissible. And what was made very, very clear at that stage to us, and we embodied it in our practice, was that e stops, it should not be possible to restart the system just by basically unlocking the e-stop, it should involve a complete system reset. But I, I was very um, uh, struck by your comment, uh, Mike, about potential for defeat of system, and particularly with some of the milking system that I was involved with, um, the propensity and ability of some and I'll call them can-do people, and I think for that another word might be idiot, um, to restore a system to operating when a component had failed, for example. And because, as you remarked, they never fail at 10 o'clock Tuesday morning, it's 4 o'clock Sunday morning and a yard full of cows to milk. And the question really was, as I've written it down there, any thoughts on how we persuade people to see safety as something other than just making systems more complicated. But I suppose on a, on a wider level as well, are we doing enough to educate those coming into our respective industries to really give due regard to safety? And also, what do we, how do we deal with those can-do people out there as well? Um, now, my, my own experiences were it, it proved in the end, from the point of view of a, an equipment manufacturer, um, easier to fulfill requirements of technical construction file creation by using off the shelf safety, specifically designed safety components, particularly where item statistics like uh, minimum time to uh, dangerous failure statistics were already available and to have uh, engineers design themselves but but and I suppose perhaps as a closing remark one quote has stayed with me for a long time from Stelios the founder of EasyJet and that was if you think safety is expensive try having an accident um, and uh, but but over to you are we are we doing enough to educate people because I, I, I do worry that we're we're only scratching the surface at the moment. Uh, thanks for the um the the comments, um, John, and, and uh, I think with regards to the, the first question that you, you raised with regards to um, uh, avoiding issues with the safety circuits and is uh, there's, a, there's a standard uh, BSE and ISO 14119, which is interlock, focused on interlocks, um, on choosing interlocks. And it very much, um, it goes through a whole decision-making process uh, of of which interlock to choose and and avoiding. So um, we know about things like uh, the magnetic switches. So magnetic switches on interlocks, which avoid um, obviously mechanical connecting parts. But then at the same time, they've got you know they have to be managed and implemented correctly. And we then need to you know pass the information on to people. So. Um, we are required as as designers to to strive for this inherently safe design measures, um, and if we need to put these safety systems in place, then um, we you know we, we we need to make them as as robust as possible, uh, and document that as as you've said before, and um, and use you know the other classic thing is is look at those machines that have been in use in four or five years and go back and look at them and. You know, you, you know, use data logger information or downloaded information, etc., that you've that's available. Um, 
So, you know, and, that, and that's really, and that, that, that takes into the area when we do introduce an electromechanical safety system that we do introduce potentially those areas that we need to manage. Um, and, and then obviously it's the system will say, well, something does go wrong, it fails safe. Um, how do we get the message across to people? Well, um, uh, then, then this whole area of, of training and uh, and people coming into the industry, uh, you know, needs to needs to reinforce this area. I, and I mean, I'm a dairy farmer's son, and I was you know brought up on 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 uh, you know working in, on farms and working on some arable farms as well. You know, um, and we all know that if you've got kit that's maintained and you've got um, you know set, you've got kit that's well maintained, kits kit that's set up for the working conditions um across the board tire pressures everything else you can get on you can really you can really push on you know i remember back in the 80s you get the bailer out um and you get things you know you 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 could you could you could ship you could clear some land same you know we'd all say that say the same so and that but at the same time then that gives the downtime for servicing machinery it gives a downtime to check for things um, um, and also not working, you know, 18 hours a day, you know, and getting too tired. Um, so all of that really encompasses in there. And, and, and those, those sit down, you know, um, you know, I was like a lot of harvest students. Um, I turned up on the farm, Terry Wisby said to me, you know, if you need to ma maintain a machine, um, just stop the engine. He didn't use a, those exact words, but something similar. Um, you know, and, um, you know, th th those type of things. So, you know, we have to, we, you know, we have to plan in those areas there, plan in that training um, and, um, and really, you know, push these things. Up. And also um, get this whole ethos of the practical and, 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 you know, textbook in there to show people, you know, you know, the, 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 the those ethos. So, I think that summarizes and 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 uh, again um you know um th this is a, an area that the, the industry is tackling. Okay, thanks for that. We'll better draw it to a close now, just a little bit over time. So thank you, Mike, for giving us an excellent presentation and taking the time out to do that for us. Uh, it's really appreciated. It's a subject uh, that could go on forever, uh, and it's certainly provoked a bit of thought. So thank you all for joining us today, and I hope you'll join us for our next lecture on the eighteenth of April where we will be joined by Dr. Tom Walters from the Small Robot Company. Tom's going to be talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning systems, and so on that are being used at the SRC for their plant surveying robots. So all that's left to say is thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.